Welcome to this DASIS workshop. Uh, my name is Farah Contessa and I'm Assistant Director of Research at DASIS and Altec. I'm very happy to be joined today by two prominent experts in the field, Dr. Brian Heiderscheid and Dr. Daniel Kobian, uh, and they will present how uh, physiological signals can be used to gain insights into neuromuscular impairments and recovery following ACL uh, reconstruction. The electromyographic signal is a key component for uh, functional assessment because by analyzing the electromyographic signal, uh, the electrical signals emanated by the contracting muscles, uh, we can learn about muscle function and the strategies that are used to perform a given sports gesture. We can analyze the overall muscle EMG signals to gain insights uh, into muscle function through the analysis of EMG amplitude and timing. And we can also break down the um, EMG signal into the individual components, that is the firing behavior of, it, of the individual motor units that comprise the muscle, and that are the fundamental units of movement and muscle force production. And by doing so, uh, we can investigate the neural mechanisms that control force and movement, um, as well as their alterations following an injury. By assessing EMG or motor unit behavior, uh, we can identify weaknesses, um, asymmetries, activation deficits, uh, particularly during critical phases of the sports gesture where the muscle may be more prone to injury. So this workshop will present findings using um, EMG signals or motor unifying behavior uh, that are obtained using either the DASIS Trinio Avanti system or the Neuromap system. The Trinio Avanti system um, includes a family of sensors uh, to support reliable and synchronous recordings from a variety of sensing modalities, including concurrent EMG and IMU recordings from the same sensor, as well as goniometers, foot switch, force sensors, and other sensing modalities through either Wi-Fi based communications or Bluetooth communication for a more portable um, option. Motor unit data are instead recording using the Neuromap system. And that's the first technology that is capable of extracting the individual motor units that drive human movement from surface EMG signals during um, dynamic contractions. And uh, this is something that has never been possible before uh, and is now can, now can be achieved within the Trino uh, platform. I would now like to introduce the speakers for this event. Uh, the first speaker will be Dr. Brian Heiderscheid. He's a professor in the Department of Orthopedics and Rehabilitation, Biomedical Engineering and Clinical Investigation at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Director of the Runners Clinic through the University of Wisconsin Sports Medicine Center, and Director of Research for Badger Athletic Performance, and Co-Director of the Neuromuscular Biomechanics Laboratory. His research is aimed at improving uh, clinical management of sports-related injury uh, with interest in running-related injuries, and it will discuss when to run after ACL reconstruction. Following talk will be given by Dr. Daniel Kobian, Assistant Professor in the Department of Orthopedics and Rehabilitation um, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's a faculty member in the Doctor of Physical Therapy program and a research scientist with the Badger Athletic Performance Lab. His research is aimed at better understanding neuromuscular implications of musculoskeletal trauma, characterizing the effects of injury on movement biomechanics, sports performance and function, and determining how to best prescribe and dose rehabilitation intervention um, to facilitate improved outcomes and long-term quality of life. And today, he will discuss the assessment of biomechanics and neuromuscular dysfunction after ACR reconstruction. Uh, so before we start, um, I also want to remind everyone to send us questions through the question um, option that you should have on your right side of the screen and not through the chat. And please do so during the talk. We will address uh, questions at the end of both talks. Um, and um, if you can, please include your uh, name and email so that if you don't we don't have the time to um, get to your question during the workshop, we can do so afterwards. Uh, so now we can start with the first presentation. Uh, Dr. Heiderscheid, thank you very much. Great, thanks Paola. And thanks Delsus for the opportunity to present some of our work today. Uh, looking forward to doing so. 
let's see. There we go, it's coming through. Okay. All right, well, good morning, everybody. Um, so the, the topic we wanna to talk about is, is when to uh, initiate running after an ACL reconstruction. So there's been a fair amount of work that's looked at returning to sport, but we wanna go a little bit earlier in that process and think about when it's the best time to return to, to running uh, in the sense of, making sure that at that three to four month window that the person is safe enough and healthy enough to begin that running process uh, and ensuring that their running mechanics are where they need to be. So quick question for you to start out the presentation. I want you to take a look at this individual running on the treadmill and from what you can tell, determine which is the surgical knee. So, a little bit of background on her. She uh, underwent an ACL reconstruction. Uh, in, in her case, it was two years before this video was recorded, and she had been back to full sporting activity during that time. Uh, and I want you to take a look at her running mechanics and see if you can identify any, any obvious differences between limbs. If we focus in particular on the mid-stance phase of the gait cycle, which is when we start to see some uh, bigger differences in terms of their overall mechanics. Can you determine which is the involved and uninvolved limb? So if you notice, obviously, in this case, we're talking about the left side, their knee is getting over her toes, shows, shows adequate knee flexion compared to the right side, clearly is labeled the involved limb, and she's not even getting anywhere close to that level of knee flexion. So again, this, this reluctance or inability to fully load that right knee uh, is, is evident in her running mechanics. So we see these sorts of asymmetries in their gait mechanics show in a variety of ways. Uh, for example, when we look at the uh, ground reaction forces, the vertical ground reaction forces, many times that active uh, peak uh, will not be at the same magnitude between the involved and the uninvolved limbs. And notice in this case, the involved limb is shown in blue at two time points, at four months, which is the dashed line, and then at six months, which is the solid line. And so you can see an incremental increase from four to six months, but still quite a bit of deficit relative to that uninvolved side. And even looking at the, the videos alone will show some level of, of differences as well. As I mentioned, the deflection position uh, is not nearly the same, but you can also begin to appreciate that because they're not flexing their knee as much, they're also uh, not reducing or lowering their center of mass as much as we would expect. Um, but when we start to look more at their knee specific metrics, again, trying to quantify this a bit, the 2D video captured it well, but again, here you can see the knee flexion during stance phase, which is that first roughly 35% of the gait cycle from about zero to 35% is stance phase. And you'll notice that the red line, which is the uninvolved limb, achieves roughly 50 degrees of knee flexion at mid stance, whereas the involved limbs are quite uh, short of that uh, range of motion, anywhere between 35 to 40 degrees, depending. And of course, this is coupled with differences in their knee extensor moments as well and related to power. And so if we look at their extensor moment during stance phase, and in particular, during the middle of stance phase, you'll notice that there's a tremendous deficit if we look at either the peak uh, uh, knee extensor moment or the knee extensor moment impulse. So we've been lucky enough over the uh, last several years to be able to uh, obtain some pretty novel data that's given us some unique insights as to the level of recovery and the timeline of of changes in running mechanics post ACL. Uh, so as part of, of the Badger Athletic Performance Program, we capture preseason healthy baseline running mechanics on a, uh, a number of athletes across various sports, which allows us to basically obtain a snapshot at their healthy pre-injury, as if you will, uh, uh, running mechanics. And then in the unlikely uh, or the, the unfortunate circumstance rather of sustaining an ACL injury, we then follow them longitudinally over a two-year period to look at their recovery of, uh, of their running mechanics. And so we have a number of time points that you'll show here, that you'll see here that all the way up to one year post-operative. And so when, we, when I show some of the work that 
that uh, one of my doctoral students, Keith Kinner, and my other doctoral student, Mikkel uh, Duakam, are working pretty aggressively on to, to get a better understanding of what this looks like in individuals as they recover from an ACL reconstruction. Now, the real novelty of these data are twofold. One, we have pre-injury data on them. So we know what they looked like before injury, right? So we know their, their level of asymmetry uh, prior to that point of, of injury. And secondly, we have longitudinal data that allows us to look within subject at how they recover over time. And again, this is a pretty aggressively active population. Uh, these are, are collegiate athletes at a very high level uh, who are getting access to fantastic care and recovery and are all being treated uh, by the same uh, uh, clinicians, both uh, surgically and through the rehab process. And I think you'll notice right off the bat, based on the top plot where it displays knee, peak knee flexion, you'll see that there's about a 15 degree uh, deficit relative to pre-injury right away on the involved side. And then even at a year later, that deficit does not resolve. We still have roughly a 10 degree deficit or so. Uh, and with same thing with peak knee, peak knee extensor moments, where we see a tremendous drop off right away of about 57%, and then uh, only improving to about a 38% deficit. Now in the black boxes I provide you are the healthy asymmetry references that we've uh, recently published in uh, the journal Medical Medicine, Science and Sport and Exercise in healthy uh, athletes of, the, of their peers for this population, we expect about a two to three degree symmetry in peak knee flexion it would be kind of that acceptable range. And for peak knee extensor moment, again, we expect about an eight to 12 percent uh, between limb asymmetry as being an acceptable range. Clearly, these individuals are well outside of those ranges. When we look at their, the amount of negative work that's being performed across joints, again, you can see differences between the ankle, knee, and hip, all being shown here at the pre-injury st standpoint. Uh, on, uh, uh, between the involved limb, which is uh, the, uh, the, the shaded uh, bars, and then the, the uninvolved limb, rather, is in the hashtag with the, the, uh, the dashed bars. And so, What's clearly evident is that they're from the time of pre-injury relative to every single uh, uh, time point post-operatively, we see that there's a major reduction in the amount of negative work that's being performed all the way up to that 12 month period. Uh, so again, even at 12 months, there's still roughly a 50%, in this case, a 46% decrease in that negative work that's being performed. Um, slight changes between the hip and the knee, but really it's the, uh, sorry, between the hip and the ankle, but it's really the knee that's driving this major unloading that we see happening on the involved limb. Now, even on the uninvolved limb, we do start to see a, a, what we believe is a compensatory change as well, where we start to see this increase uh, in energy absorption or reliance, if you will, during the energy absorption phase on that uninvolved side as well. So this leads us to kind of when is it okay to resume running? And these are the two questions we're gonna pose. So again, assuming that the person is safe to resume running, meaning that they uh, don't have any, any major effusion, they don't have uh, any other uh, 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 existing issues that would prevent them from being, that would suggest it's unsafe for them to resume, we need to first establish, do they have sufficient strength? And this is something that that Dr. Colbian is gonna talk quite a bit about in his presentation. So I'm not gonna to go too much into this at all, other than to say, we want to make sure that at first, of course, they have sufficient strength. Uh, if they don't, then we need to focus on that strength power recruitment side of, of, of the equation. Assuming they do, then we can move on to the second uh, level question, which is, do they have normal mechanics? Now, again, both of these questions are not, are they completely 100% symmetrical? It's that, with, do they have sufficient strength to run straight ahead uh, do they have normal mechanics when they're running straight ahead? Those are the two questions that we want to answer to make sure that they're safe and that running is not going to create potentially some, some uh, issues uh, further down the road that may influence their ability to return to sport. If they don't have normal mechanics, then we absolutely want to focus on some retraining techniques to ensure that they're able to do that and progress uh, into normal uh, resumption of running. So what can we do in terms of the movement mechanics standpoint? Well, again, the goal here is that we want them to, we want to encourage knee flexion to promote that quadriceps utilization. 
Uh, and again, this is we need to respect if they have anterior knee pain, in particular with any sort of a bone patellar tendon bone graft. And we need to make sure that we're, uh, we're appreciating any hip compensations that they're using to substitute for uh, underutilization of the knee. So some different strategies that can be progressive in nature is begin with walking, using an exaggerated stride length, uh, maybe even doing some groucho walking or squat walking type mechanics, moving into jogging with, again, exaggerated stride lengths, being able to actually increase their bounding. So thinking of it in terms of trying to increase their amount of center of mass vertical displacement and asking them to drive through on the push-off phase. And then we get into the running side of it again, which is uh, adding more speed elements to it, uh, making sure they continue to drive through push-off and that they're lifting heels during early swing. Now, the interesting aspect of these sort of approaches is that they're somewhat counter to what we typically do for endurance athletes overall when we talk about running-related injuries. Many times in those situations, we're trying to reduce or, or, or uh, under, uh, uh, facilitate a, a reduction in the amount of vertical displacement or shorten their stride length or reduce the loading on the knee joints. But in this case, we're trying to, to gave, give the patient more confidence in their knee and increase their utilization of the strength that they have from their quadriceps and making sure that it's engaged in that movement process as much as possible. All right, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Kobe and who will take us through the approach that we use with a lot of our quadriceps recruitment and recovery strategies. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. I'll go ahead and uh and uh, pick it up here, uh, hopefully where you left off. And again, thanks to the Delsus for the opportunity this morning um, and for all of our attendees in the session. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, expand on kind of the understanding of, or our current understanding of the neuromuscular deficiencies uh, after ACL reconstruction and how this relates to the uh, running deficits that Brian was discussing there. So any discussion of uh, neuromuscular function after uh, ACL reconstruction has to start with the quadriceps. Um, quadriceps neuromuscular dysfunction is universal after ACL injury and reconstruction and after pretty much any um, significant knee injury and surgery. Uh, as the largest muscle group in the, in the body, certainly the quadriceps plays a significant functional role. We've seen in this population specifically that poor quad function when people don't meet uh, specific limb symmetry criterion or strength to body weight criterion, um, that people move with more abnormal biomechanics. They often have increased re-injury risk or have a you know, greater likelihood of having a second ACL injury. Um, and we see impaired sports performance. Now, when people are assessing, you know, the, the typical or standard assessment of quadriceps muscle performance is a, is a maximal strength assessment. So whether that's an isometric contraction or an isokinetic contraction using a, a dynamometer, um, you know, we're typically just looking at that peak force or torque production capacity of the muscle. And the criteria for that is typically about 80 to 90% limb symmetry. That's kind of how that's typically computed. You know, the goal is to reach at least that level that would be kind of considered within the, the normal between limb ranges. However, the interesting thing, both across the literature and within our own data that we see is that even when people reach that level of quad strength symmetry, we still see, we still observe significant impairment, right? Brian was just showing us even at a year post-surgery, we still see these um, you know, significant between limb uh, asymmetries or deficiencies in terms of the knee joint function during running. Um, and oftentimes our quad strength symmetry is at a reasonable level by then. So the, the question to ask is, you know, what are we missing here? You know, what else is it? Do we need to be looking at other aspects of the muscle function beyond just the peak force generating capacity? So to kind of illustrate this question, let's take a quick look at a case study. This is data from one of our collegiate soccer players five months post ACL reconstruction. So the, the uh, torque time signal on the right here is from an isometric uh, ramp and hold style contraction. So the athlete is instructed to, you know, to attempt to extend the knee and then you know, kick out as hard as they can holding the contraction for four or five seconds. So that's the torque time signal on the top here. And then we have the surface electromyography from the, or the rectified surface electromyography from the vastus lateralis of both limbs here. On these slides, the healthy limb is always shown in black, the involved or injured limb is shown in red. 
So we can see, you know, by this data, if we're just looking at this peak uh, torque generation of the muscles, that the limb symmetry index is 88%. It's actually pretty good. I mean, for five months post-surgery, we would say that's that's above average. Um, and so, you know, just looking at this, we would say, hey, doing great. You know, muscle performance is exactly where we want it to be. Um, you know, we're, we're ahead of schedule. But when we look at how this athlete moves at that same time, you know, this is five months post-surgery, when the athlete performs a counter movement jump, we still see these knee joint kinetic asymmetries of 30 or 40 percent. Uh, when the athlete runs uh, on our treadmill, you know, now we have a stance phase uh, knee kinetic symmetry of only 30%. There's a 70% between limb uh, deficit there. Um, and as Brian pointed out, you know, the, the max knee flexion angle during the stance phase for the subject, there was a 14 degree difference. So that's a pretty prominent difference. Um, so what's going on here? You know, if he has proper quadriceps strength, why is he not, you know, able to, to move more symmetrically? So one of the things we could do is kind of take a step back and say, okay, well, well how do people use the the muscle to perform, you know, both daily and sporting activities. So if we look at, you know, the surface electromyography patterns during human activity, whether it's walking, stairs, sit to stand, or sporting activity, you know, even like running, changing direction, jumping, more prominent with those types of things, we see that we see these brief periods of rapid activation and relaxation. So muscles on, off, on, off, on, off, right? That that kind of ramp and hold pattern that doesn't exist, right, in most of these, these typical daily or sporting activities. The time to develop this contractile force is very short. Uh, it's 100 to 300 milliseconds typically. And as the speed of movement increases, the time to develop that muscular force only decreases. So on this slide, the you know the image was just the the surface uh, EMG signal of the quads during you know during running, and we can see it firing during the stance phase of running. Now we're looking at the knee joint moment. So Brian was mentioning the peak knee extensor moment. This is during the stance phase of running. So just kind of taking a look at you know as the the foot hits the ground, that peak knee extensor moment is generated about mid stance phase. What I want to draw your attention to is look at the x-axis. That's the time, right? The time to develop that peak knee extensor moment is about 100 milliseconds, so about a tenth of a second. Can you reach you know, peak force generating capacity of the muscle in a tenth of a second? No, you cannot. So we need to be thinking about rate maybe more so than just the, the maximal capacity of the muscle. Now the running speed in that clip is only a nine minute mile, right? It's only about three meters per second. Pretty slow, right, in terms of a pace, and certainly for a sprinting sport or something like that, it's very slow. So again, you know, this, this really has implications for sporting activities where things have to happen quickly. So now let's take a look at that athlete's data when we ask him to perform a different type of contraction. Now we're asking him, still an isometric contraction, but we're asking him to kick out against the pad as fast and as hard as he can. Eh? And again, we see the the torque signals and the the surface EMG signals here. This paints a very different picture of quadriceps function. When we look at the rate of torque development, which is the slope of the torque time signal here, we see a big difference, right, between limbs. Now we see a limb symmetry index of only 40 to 60%, depending on which measure that we're using here. And if we look at the rate of quadriceps activation, we see a similar limb symmetry index of you know, roughly 50%. So the issue here may not be the peak force generating capacity of the muscle, it may be the inability to drive the system quickly. So this is just a, you know, a case study, obviously that's one way to, to look at the data, but that doesn't tell us too much. Let's take a look across a larger group of our athletes. So this is, is data from 16 of our University of Wisconsin athletes who've you know, suffered an ACL injury, underwent reconstruction, and these are our quadriceps strength. So this is that first measurement, peak strength production at four, six, and 12 months post-surgery. And we can see the, the group you know, uh, average limb symmetry indices above each column there. So 12 months post-surgery, again, about 88%, right? I mean, it's good. You know, We'd like to maybe see that happening a little bit early in the recovery, but again, that's right about those criteria on levels. Eight out of our 16 subjects have reached 90% quad strength symmetry uh, at 12 months post-surgery. But as Brian showed, we still see these, these significant, you know, between limb asymmetries in the, in the movement patterns. Now let's look at the quadriceps rate of torque development data uh, over that same period of time. Big differences in those limb symmetry indices. This typically trails the recovery of strength by about 15, 20% or so um, in regards to those symmetry measures. Okay, so that paints a very different picture of recovery across the whole group. And then, 
if we're looking at rate of activation, so again, this would be using the surface EMG signal um, and calculating kind of the, the rate of activation in the early portion of the contraction, averaging it across the muscles. This, especially in the, the later phases of recovery, six to 12 months post-surgery, parallels the rate of torque development data. You know, so we can suggest that that's strongly related to the inability to rapidly drive the system. Um, for both the rate of torque development data and the rate of activation data, we have only two out of 16 subjects who reach 90% limb symmetry by 12 months post-surgery. So if you need to be able to fire that muscle quickly in order to, you know, to run with, with uh, reasonable between limb symmetry, it's no surprise that we continue to see uh, such movement mechanics asymmetries at 12 months. So this is data, you know, I'm, the previous slides, I'm showing you data from an isometric contraction, right? Um, and that's, you know, certainly a, a very controlled way of assessing the muscle function. Um, you know, but one of the things I've certainly heard from people over time is, well, you know, that's what's the muscle doing when the person's actually performing a task, right? That's a very, um, you know, a, a, it's a non-functional way of assessing it. So we have looked at this and we've, we've started to look at this in significant depth, depth with the jump data um, and we're working on the running data as well. Um, but what the rate of activation looks like during these tasks. Um, so assessing the rate of activation during each phase of the counter movement jump or during that stance phase of running, you know, how fast that, that muscle recruitment occurs. Um, and we do observe significant between limb asymmetries with the, uh, during the performance of the, the dynamic movements as well. One of the things that we're working on, this is just pilot data from one subject, you know, kind of trying to take the next step and saying, you know, can we, can we go further down to, to um, you know, the, the, maybe the signal uh, motor unit level and, and see kind of where those deficits are arising from, you know, is it by muscle and, and what, how significant those deficits are. So this is using a surface EMG um, with a signal decomposition um, capacity. Um, and this is just one, you know, basketball players kind of had a, a few knee injuries. And so we were looking, trying to look in, in greater depth and see if there's anything we saw there. I've seen maybe one abstract from another group who had, you know, enough data from this type of, of analysis to present. Um, but it certainly um, may create uh, real nice opportunities in the future to further understand or to, you know, understand in more depth kind of where some of those neuromuscular deficits are arising from. Okay, so let's wrap it up by going back to kind of this initial question of how does this quadriceps muscle performance or this neuromuscular deficiency that we're observing really relate to the running joint kinetics, right? We've seen both of these, but do they actually relate to each other? So this was an abstract that we uh, presented at uh, the APTA combined sections meeting last year, and currently being drafted into a manuscript, but we, we looked at quadriceps strength, quadriceps rate of torque development, and time from surgery in relation to knee joint kinetic symmetry during running in our athletes. And what we observed is that people with greater than 90%, so that, you know, reaching the 90% LSI for rate of torque development had 30% greater running knee kinetic symmetry than those who did not reach that criterion value for rate of torque development. Um, and that was after adjusting for strength and time from surgery. And when we adjusted for quadriceps RTD, there was no association between strength uh, and running the extensor LSI or time from surgery. Um, so what we you know, surmise is that quadriceps rate of torque development is a better indicator of this, of this uh, knee extensor kinetic symmetry during running than, than peak strength. So just to kind of illustrate this, you know, like to show the data, here's a scatter plot of um, nearly, you know, all of the collections that, that we have for post-ACL. Yes, there are some repeats in here, you know, that's accounted for in our data analysis. On the x-axis, we have, oh, I have, it's quad power, that's rate of torque development, um, limb symmetry index. On the y-axis is that running knee extensor um, limb symmetry index. So we can clearly see the relationship here, right? There's an obvious linear relationship. Those with, with better quadriceps, RTD symmetry run, you know, or have, better running uh, knee kinetic symmetry. Here's that band of kind of normal, right? Normal between limb variation. Brian mentioned, you know, we have a, a manuscript published with the healthy between limb variation. That Those are the number of subjects that we have that fall within that band. So it's not too many, right? And when we look at those nine subjects, we see that the quad RTD LSI in that group is 98%, okay? So I, I take two, I have two take homes uh, kind of from this, uh, um, graphic and to wrap us up. One is that basically a well-functioning quadriceps is required for running knee kinetic symmetry. Okay, that's kind of to me like lowest common denominator, right? If you're trying to, to, to run or perform the task without the underlying, you know, muscle performance or neuromuscular performance needed, 
there's no way you can perform it successfully. It's just, it's not possible trying to cheat the system. And two, a well-functioning quadriceps does not guarantee running knee kinetic symmetry, right? We do see a number of individuals here who have good quad uh, RTD symmetry, but haven't reached these levels. So just because you have that quad power doesn't mean you're, you're guaranteed to run symmetrically. Then it goes back to the graphic that Brian had at the end of his uh, talk, where now the next step is to do you know, running mechanics training uh, and really work on the motor control aspects. So that about wraps it up for me. Uh, thanks very much for your time. Thank you very much uh, for both speakers. Uh, we, we'll try to answer maybe a couple of questions. We are already running out of time, but we'll uh, a uh, couple of questions that uh, we have received during the talks. One uh, uh, for Dr. Heider Scheidt, um, and it's, is there a specific guidelines that you use to define sufficient strength? Yeah, that's a million dollar question. That's exactly what we are trying to get a better handle on now. As Dan mentioned on that last slide, I think it really illustrates it well. Um, you know, in terms of how much uh, asymmetry and, and quad power or strength may be necessary. I think what it comes down to is we want to make sure that sufficient strength really is that they can sufficiently control their movement, that they could uh, display normal uh, gait mechanics. Now, some literature or some guidelines that have been published, people will recommend 70% uh, of the peak torque on the involved limb relative to the uninvolved. Others may say 80%. I would actually say, argue that you could sufficiently run well even with a lower magnitude of strength than that. Um, but don't quote me on what that number is yet because I don't think we have that quite established. And that is exactly what, what we are trying to, to come up with. Thank you. And the one question for Dr. Kobian. Um, do you think that the contribution to knee extension torque from the four quadriceps muscles could be altered after ACL reconstruction? Uh, just to clarify, asking, is the contribution the same from the four quadriceps muscles? Was that the, the question? Okay, yeah, I mean, I definitely would say that um, the, you know, what we've seen, the, the deficits that we've seen in quadriceps muscle performance um, across the, the heads of the quadriceps, you know, our analysis is mostly the, the three superficial heads that we've, you know, obviously looked at at this point in more depth. We, we consistently see with the variety of our measures, both what I showed you today and some of the other things that we've been looking at, um, that the uniarticular vasti are more affected. Um, you know, some of the, the earlier literature that's out there looking at uh, muscle size or muscle volume tends to show that the vastus lateralis may be the most affected uh, in terms of the atrophy after this injury and surgery. Um, we've seen in terms of the kind of the, the activation patterns um, that and the control aspects that both the VL and the VM seem to be much more affected than the, than the rectus. Thank you. So we are running a bit late, so I will have to uh, uh, close this workshop uh, now, uh, but we get back to um, 20 other questions uh, afterwards. Um, in closing the workshop, I would like to first of all thank the speakers for uh, the wonderful presentations. And uh, also I would like to announce a few new products that um, have been recently released or that will be released, um, will be available later this year. And the one is the new, um, new light, um, a portable and uh, economical version um, wireless EMG setup uh, that provides reliable transmission through a small USB dongle um, that plugs directly into a computer, removing the need of for carrying a base station um, for receiving signals from the wireless sensors and so for a more portable um, assessment tool in the clinic or in the field. Um, the Trinio Maze system that's already available, 16 channel high density MG sensor for expanding um, muscle assessment to regional activation maps uh, in real time. And the Trinio Vision a package that's currently under development and includes um, synchronized EMG with a Zur Kinect developer kit uh, for video based uh, body tracking. So, for any questions, um on these uh products or any anything else please uh, feel free to reach out uh to us at contact and i thank again 
uh, the speakers for this uh, wonderful presentation on uh, planning an assessment after the sale reconstruction. And thank you all the participants um, for attending this workshop. Thank you. <laughs>